asking me to uh, do this talk for you, uh, especially uh, barbers. We, uh, we met at the uh, Master Gardeners uh, conference and uh, we started talking about water quality again. Um, water quality for orchids is basically my emphasis, but it applies to all plants. And so there's a couple questions I want to ask. How many of you use rainwater? Okay, Not quite me. a bit of you. How many of you fertilize your plants? Okay. How many just leaves it up to God? <laughs> okay. Well, there's a little bit of that, all of that that we do with plants that we take into our uh, care. Okay, when we when we have plants out in nature, they get taken care of whatever happens to them. But when we take plants into our care, there's a lot of things we have to think about, okay? Uh, now, are you going to advance? Okay, so um, first of all, um, Kai Clausen came up with a lot of the figures that he came up with the presentation, but it was very cut and dry. And I, I tried to make a presentation uh, for other uh, types of uh, plants, and so, uh, I've, I made the modifications and I'm now doing talks uh, for other types of plants. So uh, even though we're going to talk, um, you'll see a lot of things based on what I do and it's based for orchids, but it applies to all plants, okay? So one of the things I first want to uh, <coughs> See if I get this on first. Go, go. Okay. So, um, can, does that work? Yes. Okay. So, uh, first of all, there's not a whole lot of science. Uh, it's just an understanding of what we do with our water. Okay. So, if you want to take notes, that'd be great. But I don't think you really need to. It's just okay. it's more or less common sense. Uh, kind of ideas uh, for water, for using water on your plants. First of all, I want to emphasize how important water is. Okay, if you look over here, there's carbon dioxide and water on this equation. And what, and what do we get from that? We get oxygen and sugars. So sugars are used by the plants to build cellular structure. And so this is the basic formula that the plant needs to even start uh, doing with photosynthesis, okay? So look how important it is. Carbon dioxide is generally available in the air and we have to provide the water because essentially we're in an environment here that doesn't uh, give you a whole lot of water during the year. So it's really important that we think about what we do with the water. Um, if you have rainwater, and I'm again I'm, I'm emphasizing orchids, uh, you have to remember in nature rainwater comes naturally. What do we do with with our water, and where does it come from? Um, first of all, um, we don't get much of it here in Southern California, so we get it from the Colorado River, and we get it from Northern California. Um, water is basically hydrogen and oxygen, and they separate into ions, a hi, a sep, an individual hydrogen ion and an OH ion. That gives us positive and negative uh, ions in our water. Now, the, the, the molecules will break apart and then recombine, but the natural uh, breaking apart uh, is usually in a form of um, I'm not sure if it's up there, but uh, we, we measure that in terms of pH. And pH 7 is where there's an equal amount of, of both of them, okay? Uh, so orchids in general like to have a pH somewhere between 5.8 to 6.2. 
And most plants like it a little bit more acidic than they like it um, uh, uh, alkaline. And what happens with our water here in Southern California, it comes from very long distances. It travels along aqueducts, picks up minerals, then it gets dumped into our reservoirs, spends more time picking up minerals, and by the time we get it out of our faucet, it has absorbed a lot of those minerals. How many of you drink your water straight out from the faucet? Okay. So there's very few of us. Okay. Do we do that because we don't have any other source? Or do we do that because we like the taste of the water? Or do we do that because you don't think about the water quality? When it comes to plants, okay, they generally have their own system of absorbing the water. But when I emphasize orchids is because epiphytic orchids, the water that lands on an epiphytic orchid is straight and not buffered by any soils. Go ahead. Okay, so what happens is a lot of the minerals that is in the water starts as the water is being used, the minerals are also absorbed, but a lot of it is in, in a, too much abundance. I wanted to show you that what we, what the, the minerals that come out of the water, what they do is they cum accumulate as salts. You can see right here at the edge of the rock, uh, a lot of it in the, in, the, um, in the tree roots, and especially, go ahead, and especially you could see that uh, there's a buildup on the edge of the roots, okay? But also uh, plants that are much more sensitive to the salts, like the moss, is dying. Okay, that's a reaction to the salts being in too much of a abundance. Go ahead. Now with orchids, you could see that uh, because we have we use pots, you could see that the salts accumulating at the, at the uh, drainage holes. Uh, they accumulate on the leaves, but especially, go ahead, advance. Especially on the roots, because the roots absorb the moisture, but don't necessarily absorb all the minerals, and so it builds up on the edge of the roots. We see here healthy roots, the healthy uh, root tips, but they also uh, are building up on the moss and are, and as the salts accumulate, it actually kills the roots, okay? So that's the reason why with epiphytic plants, it's very important to keep a real close eye on it. With your, with your bonsai plants, it's probably not as critical. Go ahead. Okay, so what we want to talk about is these uh, solids, these minerals. Uh, total dissolved solids uh, is basically any mineral, salts or metals uh, that form positive and neg negative ions, and they're suspended in the water, okay? Uh, it's expressed in parts per million, and um, there are testers to, to give you that, to tell you how much of that you, we have. Okay, the pH, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's a negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration and that's the reason why uh, it is um, neutral is considered seven. But we have to realize this is a this is the exponent, okay, the exponent of the equation. So every change of pH, every single digit of pH is ten times stronger than the other. Is stronger or weaker? Go ahead. Now the way to test that, uh, how many have ever used a soil testing kit? Okay. Usually a salt testing kit will give you the three basic uh, tests for the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but it also has a test for, um, for pH, and that's because the pH is really important because the minerals cannot be absorbed if the pH is incorrect, okay? The other way to test that, the, the, the pH, is through a meter, uh, like this one here, uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, this is the TDS, this is the uh, pH meter, and you can also test it with little uh, strips, pH strips. But on the market you also have uh, combined function meters like this one that tests all of those all at once. And um, a lot of those can be found at uh, hydroponic stores, really inexpensive. This unit here is a lot more expensive, but you can get inexpensive ones at the hydroponic stores. Or, you know, if you just want to do the test strips, it's really easy, but it's just really basic. It doesn't give you any specific uh, indication of where you are. Okay, so let's talk about the setting of tap water. Uh, generally, we have uh, three treatment facilities, uh, and, and we have three sources that basically the Colorado River, Northern California, and what little we have, we get here in Southern California. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that no matter, this is a, an analysis chart that came from the San Diego water. Um, I don't know if you can read it right here, www.sandiego.gov. But if you look at the highlighted things, is that all these uh, numbers are extremely high, okay? Uh, normally a lot of fertilizers are based on 100 parts per million, and we're already looking at just the, some of the minerals in our water already starts off at two or three hundred. Uh, so we have extremely high concentrations of the minerals that the plants cannot utilize in, the, in those concentrations. Okay, so the methods for the removing these uh, dissolved solids uh, is either through uh, one of these five methods. We'll ignore the two bottom ones, or the three bottom ones actually, because you usually have to have large scale equipment to do that with. For most of us at the home uh, level, we'll either use ion exchange, which is DI, reverse osmosis, or we resort to collecting rainwater. Um, so um, there's things on the market called, you know, like Brita filters that you put on a, a canister, um, on a pitcher in your, in your refrigerator, or you screw it onto your faucet. Those are low concentration removal filters, and they only remove very large particles that you can taste, okay? So that's the reason why those filters are popular, because it makes your water taste good, but doesn't do anything for the, for the overall minerals for your plants. Because I once tested a, a friend's water. She says, oh yeah, I got a filter for my, for my uh, water for my orchids. I said, well, what kind? She goes, oh, it's one of these, you know, bread of charcoal filters. And I happened to have my meter with me because I was doing this talk at that society. And I said, well, let's test your water. So give me a sample of your water without, um, um, without going through your filter and then give me a sample of one that goes through your filter. So the sample without the filter was about 256, about 260 so. So already she had fairly decent, okay water, not real bad. And then she gave me the sample uh, that had gone through the filter and it was like 250. <laughs> so you know, it's like only about uh, six parts per million was taken out, but if you tasted the water, it tasted really good. But it didn't do much good for, for her orchid, so I, I told her, you know, that the problem with that type of filter is it only takes out the very, very large compounds, the organic compounds. Um, and then, of course, there's magnetic devices. Uh, I was always told, oh yeah, the magnetic devices keeps your pipe clean and, and, and it gets rid of the the minerals. It doesn't get rid of the minerals. What it does is it changes the ion structure so they recombine, okay, and so you don't have the ions, but it's still in the water and then once you put it on your plants, then they separate again and there the, the ions are back. You don't measure it in that respect, but it's, it's still there in your water, okay, so, and, and then of course what we don't want is softened water because that just replaces some minerals with something else.
Okay, so uh, as I said about the uh, Brita filters, it really doesn't do much good. One more. Okay, so we, ha we're, we then have to resort to either deionized or reverse osmosis. And um, we can either buy it at the grocery store, it's real simple, you know, just get a bottle of, um, of uh, deionized or reverse osmosis water. It tends to be expensive this way, plus you have to carry it. Okay, then they, then they have vending machines of uh, deionized or reverse osmosis. And it's a little bit better because the price goes down. It's usually about uh, 25 cents per gallon, but we still have to bring our own containers and still bring it home. Okay, next. Um, so we have um, methods that do that to do this at home. With a, with a uh, deionized uh, purification, what we have is we have a resin that absorbs the different uh, positive or negative ions and then removes those minerals out of the water. Okay? Um, and um, uh, But the one thing with the deionized is that it will only absorb uh, charged ions. Uh, this is how it works. The water goes through uh, the tanks with the resin, and the charged resin removes the minerals. And so what you get is demineralized water. Go ahead. And so there's a couple of ways that you could have that, okay? There are zero water filters. Uh, uh, they're very convenient. You typically uh, connect it to your, uh, to your faucet and you get uh, clean water. However, these zero filters fill up very quickly, and so it's only intended for small collections. And they'll cost about 50 cents a gallon, so still pretty expensive. Okay. Uh, then, there's, then there's a method where you could rent tanks. There are companies out there that, you know, like Culligan and um, California, I forget now, but anyway, you can buy the, you can rent these tanks. Water will go through the tanks, and what you what the water that comes out of there is uh, a clean water. Okay, and the problem with this one is you're committed to renting, so there's always a charge. Go ahead. Uh, this is a mixed bed uh, system. As you can see, the water goes from the faucet into the tank and then comes out and it's in the faucet. Okay, so it's just one connection. And it's a big uh, bed because both the negative and the positive ions are being taken out by one tank. And these are just additional tanks. Go ahead. Um, this is a, uh, a DI system that uses two tanks. Okay, one. It, uh, the water goes into both tanks, first into one and then into the other one, and it, individually it removes the negative ions and the positive ions, and then you end up with clean water. Uh, Ron Kaufman here, he happens to have a, uh, a fertilizer injector because one of the problems with cleaning out your water is it removes everything. Okay, so you have to put the minerals back in. Okay, so the third system on, the, on DI is to own your own tanks. You can buy the tanks outright, and then you'll have to clean them out every so often, okay? First of all, because you own, this, own the tanks, the cost goes down overall in the usage of the, of the tanks. So, um, but uh, anyway, it involves hazardous chemicals, uh, lyes and acids to clean these resins uh, so that they can continue doing the job. Okay, now with reverse osmosis, the process is a little bit different. It uses a membrane for the water to go through and it removes all the minerals in that respect. And it, it removes both ions as well as uh, non-charged particles. Uh, the problem with reverse osmosis is that it's, it tends to be slow. 
you, you either collect it in a pressure tank or you collect it in an open reservoir. Either way, it takes a while for that to happen. Uh, and it does create what is in the industry called wastewater. Although I like to change the, the wording of that, but uh, we'll talk about that next. Okay, now the way the purification principle works is the water with all its minerals and stuff goes through a membrane and then what comes out is clean water. Okay, so RO in that respect removes everything. The problem with the membrane is it eventually wears out. Okay, next. So there's a couple of ways to handle RO. You can either have a little pressure tank, the water uh, gets clean and goes into the tank, creates a little bit of pressure. So you initially have a little bit of pressure and, uh, uh, and the cost is fairly low to operate. Um, the cons of that is that uh, reverse osmosis, you don't re rent those type of equipment. You buy that out, right? And so you have an initial out outlay for uh, the reverse osmosis filters, okay? And then the, the biggest uh, drawback with reverse osmosis is that you have very, no pressure or little pressure. So a lot of that means you have to find a method to apply that water to whatever you need. Uh, so you can either do it as a reservoir system where you collect the water, okay? And then what you'll need is you'll need a, um, a, a pump or a sprayer. You can, you, you can hand pressurize a, a, a pump and then spray it, or you can use like a pond pump and create pressure that way. Uh, so we have both a, a tank and a reservoir uh, showing here. The tanks can be fairly large tanks, or they can be just underneath your sink. A lot of people have little RO uh, uh, valves. Um, with a pressure tank underneath their sink. The other way is to, is to collect water in the reservoir and then find a way to utilize that, uh, you know, just from a reservoir. Okay. Now what Kai uses is a combination of DI and RO. What he does is he uses, uh, um, what he told me was is that his RO system alone uh, gets a 6 to 18 uh, microsiemens, which is an indication of parts per million. And then with the, uh, with the DI and the RO um, combined, he gets uh, less than five. Now, what he does is um, he uses the DI system to initially remove most of the, uh, um, the particles, and then what he has left over uh, gets uh, taken out, or is it the other way around? The other way around. The other way around, yeah, the, <laughs> RO, the RO first, uh, because RO will deteriorate, the filter will deteriorate over time, and then whatever happens to get through the filter will get taken out by the uh, deionized system. Uh, what happens is that it allows this deionized system to operate longer, because it's not being used to remove all the the particles. So in that respect, you get a little, a little bit more use out of your DI system. Okay, this is my system. I have a, an RO filter with pre-filters, and it all collects in these big giant uh, reservoir tanks. And then through plumbing, I connect it to a pond up here, and I use it through my uh, a sprinkler system. So, you know, it, it's, I didn't want to spend the time uh, pumping up my sprayers, and the tanks were too small. So I went through the reservoir system, and, and I even have additional uh, uh, barrels that I use to mix my fertilizer before it gets pumped into my uh, sprinkler system. Okay, next. Okay, so the RO system that um, Kai has set up, um, as you can see, he's, he figures it's for about 600 orchids. $150 for the RO system. Uh, you can get a more expensive uh, system instead of the one to four ratio. He's got uh, one to one or uh, one to two ratios. Uh, uh, but it's, it's a little bit more expensive. He spent $120 for a 10 gallon pressure tank. 
and so on. And so um, with my system, because I, uh, it's bigger, uh, I use more water, I filter through it, and then uh, so my system, even though it costs more initially to get started, in the long run, it was less per, uh, per gallon of water. Okay. Oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you about the wastewater. Four gallons of water go, uh, goes into the filter, one comes out clean, and three gets wasted. Okay. Well, they call it wastewater because they're only talking about the filter system. I use the excess water in my yard so it doesn't get wasted. Uh, all my outside water, uh, all my outside plants get a little bit more of the minerals, but they can handle it, you know, because they're in the soil. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about what the advantages are. With DI, you have extremely fast and high pressure system. It's just like opening up a faucet. So you can use all the water that you need and it goes through the tank and the, um, the resin uh, uh, particles does all the work, okay? Uh, and there's no wastewater. However, the problem is you have a monthly service charge. Whether you use one drop, you go on vacation, use one drop, or whether you're there watering it all the time, you're going to have that service, monthly service charge. And then in addition to that, you have to uh, replace the filters after the, the resins are used up. Uh, the advantages with uh, reverse, reverse osmosis it's, it's an extremely simple system, okay? But again, it's very slow. You're gonna need uh, a way to, uh, uh, to create pressure to use it. And uh, it does have some TDS creep because the, the membrane wears out. And of course, you have the initial cost of, of buying the whole system right, outright in the, in the beginning. With uh, DI, you just pay that monthly charge, take on a contract, okay, and you, for immediately for that one monthly charge, you you have great water. So that's the nice thing about DI is that you don't have the initial outlay of all the equipment; you just rent it, okay. Um, okay, so this is just a quick idea of the cost. Uh, Ron said that he, uh, he spends about $780 for about 5,000 uh, gallons, so his cost is about 16 cents a gallon, okay? Helen's number, um, which is the one that had the, the single tank, uh, she spends uh, a monthly rental fee and then a replacement tank, and so for about 2,500 gallons, she spends about 28 cents a gallon, okay? Um, now, Kai's, ex Kai's experience with his system, which is a combination of RO and DI, he gets uh, his down to about five cents a gallon, okay? With my method, I have to replace my filters more often because I don't use any uh, pre-DI, but I use a, hot, a lot more, so I, I buy bigger filters, I get more water through the bigger filter than you would a smaller filter. So based on my experience, mine costs about two and a half cents per gallon, okay? Go ahead. Oh, uh, okay, so um, let me just uh, point out a few things before, um, before I stop. Um, the thing is, when you remove all the minerals out of your water and you have pure water, neither humans nor plants can survive on it. Okay? We have to have some of those minerals. Uh, calcium, magnesium, all the trace minerals, plus we have to have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium for our plants. That's why all the fertilizers provide the major uh, nutrients, the, uh, Nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And then uh, the water generally provides all the trace minerals and as well as cal calcium and magnesium. When you remove all that, then what, what does the plant have to survive on? Now, when it comes to my epiphytic orchids, they rely strictly on what's in the water. A lot of you with your bonsai 
there's a lot of minerals in your soil. So even though you, you, you water with absolutely pure water, the plants can still survive on the minerals and the uh, nutrients that is available in the soil. But eventually that depletes as well. So you're going to have to fertilize and you're going to have to put back some of these minerals. And there's two ways to do that. Either you can um, uh, buy a fertilizer that has all those ingredients. Okay, there's, there's one that's called the Michigan State University uh, recipe. It puts all the trace minerals back in, in addition to the major three, and it also provides the calcium and the magnesium. The other way to do it, which is the way I do it, is I water with tap water. And then I use my RO to rinse out the excess. So I use it more as a flush rather than as a watering system. Okay. Now the flush gets used as well by the plants, but it, uh, it removes, it allows the plants to flush out the excess minerals and then still survive on the tap water. Okay. So basically that's my talk. Thank you. And uh, I'll answer any questions. Any questions? Any idea of, uh, yes? Uh, I'm not sure about the word structured, but if you're talking about adding filtration to your water, again, we, st we, we have the, uh, uh, the carbon type uh, filters. They don't do a thing for our plants. Okay, they just make the water taste well. If you want to remove the minerals, then you have to either go deionize or reverse osmosis. Yes? So if you use the water from the faucet, yes. Yes, you could do that. Like mm -hmm. Because we have so many minerals, yeah. there's always an excess of, the, of those for our plants. Yeah, I just use my, see, because I have a lot of epiphytic orchids where the uh, roots are hanging out in the air, I have to use it a little bit more often. But with, uh, with, your, uh, uh, with your plants, you could probably um, use, you know, maybe uh, one, one to two or one to three ratio, and you'd be fine because you just want to have the minerals that come naturally come in water available to your plants. Yes. Well, actually, when the plant is has a lot of water, the concentration on the minerals is not that critical. It's when the water disappears, gets used up and evaporates. Then the minerals, let's say you have 10 minerals to 100 uh, particles of water. As soon as the water's gone, you got 10 minerals straight. Okay, so that's where it becomes really critical is when the concentration gets so high and the water amount of water is, is less. If you keep your, your plants always wet, your plants can deal with a lot of excess minerals. It's when it when the water gets used up that it becomes critical. That's why we, we, we say salt buildup. Okay? It isn't just the, the minerals in the water, it's the buildup. The constant adding and the, the water gets used up or evaporates, but the minerals remain. Yeah, the, cl the chlorine doesn't tend to be quite as bad because it evaporates very quickly. Uh, but yeah, the minerals, especially uh, sodium salts, are, are extremely hard on plants. Do you understand what, what the, the minerals does to your water when it, when it gets so low? The salts, uh, uh, how many of you have ever made ice cream at home? Why do you add salts to your ice? Because the salts grabs on the water molecule and takes it away, okay, from the ice uh, cube. And so what happens is when you remove those molecules from the ice cube, the ice cube has to get colder, okay? Well, the salts in your, in your water does the same thing. It grabs the water molecules, okay? And if you don't have enough water, it starts pulling it out of the roots of the plants. Yes? Have 
Well, the, the drainage holes prevent excess water from accumulating, okay? But what's, what is really critical is the, the amount of water that evaporates and gets used up by the plant. In so doing, it, it leaves behind the minerals and then it becomes an accumulation of salts. So as long as the water runs out, you don't have a problem. And in fact, if you have enough of it run out, it'll redissolve some of those minerals that have uh, come into, into uh, a crystalline form. It'll flush some of that out. So there is a way of just flushing your plants too. But the problem is, once a salt is created, it takes so much more water to, to get it back into uh, ions that you would have to flush your, your plants a lot. That's why it's better to flush with pure water, okay, or, and, and don't have your plants completely dry out. Yes? What happens if you just lower the pH? Okay, the pH uh, is the water ions, okay, not the mineral ions, it's the water ions. The pH affects how the minerals become available to your plants. Um, in the orchid business, they have a chart showing which particular type of plant uh, takes better advantage of certain minerals in, in a certain pH. Most plants will, will like to take uh, minerals up in a, a more acidic environment. That's the re reason why they usually say 5.8 to 6.2 uh, pH. So the pH itself is an indication of the mineral ions created by the water, okay? Plus, of course, it affects the other minerals. But yes, if you lowered the pH, you would cause certain uh, uh, chemicals to precipitate out. So you could but, just add, say, some vinegar to uh, vinegar to a watering can. Yeah, you could. However, the pH doesn't remove enough. Okay, the, the pH is just in, indicates the, the equilibrium status. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've reduced enough of the minerals. It just it has an equilibrium status, you know. So, for instance, if you had a, a, a cup of uh, water with a little bit of sugar, it'll tell you what the balance is of the, diff, the positive and negative ions. You put more sugar in, it's not going to change because the, the balance is still the same. See, so you've just added more minerals, but you haven't changed much in terms of the pH because the balance is the same. But we'll say. Take the example of calcium. Yeah. So one of the salts that you see on the roots is calcium, right? Generally, yeah. Yeah. We have so a lot of that. If you if you put uh, enough vinegar to say lower the pH to six, would the calcium build up on the root in the same way? Uh. Well, there's no happy solution to just get rid of calcium because you've got all these other minerals. Calcium and magnesium are in the balance, and you want to and you want to maintain that balance so the plants can ha do one or the other. If you just change the pH, you're going to get rid of calcium, but you're going to uh, erase the magnesium, and then it becomes toxic, okay? So just changing the pH doesn't get rid of your minerals in the right form. The best way is to remove them, and then put them back in the right percentage, which is why fertilizers uh, are so great, you know, because they give you the minerals, and they give you a formula. Uh, NPK, you know, whether it's 20, 20, 20, you know what's in there. What you don't know is what comes, normally comes in your uh, water. I see. Yeah. And, and the reason why they uh, only uh, give you the, why most fertilizers only give you NPK, because that's the quantity that's missing, the minerals that are missing in your water. Okay? So whether you create compost tea or you add other kind of organics into your soil, that's what provides the minerals. And what's usually missing is the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. And that's why fertilizers provide those three, ideally. And then if you have a, a one that has the micronutrients, it'll, it'll do all the other metals. And then, uh, uh, you know, hopefully you'll also add Super Thrive, because it has more than the minerals. It has um, uh, I don't know, all kinds of other compounds that plants can utilize better. And it provides it hormones and this and that that helps plants thrive. But again, a lot of that can be uh, gotten just from the, a good quality soil. 
with our orchids, okay, because they're epiphytic, we have to provide everything in its proper mix, okay? The plants can tolerate bad mixes or, or, and take what they need, but we just can't let that bad mix accumulate as salts. So the problem with epiphytic orchids is that they want pure conditions 99% of the time. And when it rains, the first rains will dissolve all the bird poop and the monkey poop and all that stuff and provide it for the orchids in a full dose, okay? And as it continues to rain, it rinses all that off. Thank you, Nico, very okay, much. Okay, thank you.